Welcome into the post Christmas edition of the Husker 24 7 podcast. Everyone on the screen had a wonderful last 48 hours. We won't even have to discuss that with small talk and banter. We're just going to dive right into what we didn't get to discuss last week, which was the addition of Ben Scott, who joins Nebraska's class, their 2023 total talent edition class. Uh, Ben Scott, a multi-year starter for Arizona State along the offensive line, arguably gives Nebraska, uh, you know, maybe the biggest instant addition that they've added so far. I mean, that's a debate. We we embrace debate on this show, so we'll embrace that in a little bit. But we're just going to dive right into it. Ben Scott, BC, I know you talked to him. I know I found out like 48 hours or 24 hours before the commitment that there's a long-standing Columbus tradition there. So that's great. Columbus remains locked into uh, Nebraska football, you know, even without Ernest Hausman. What do we need to know about Ben Scott? St. Louis High School product, Arizona State transfer, BC, take it away. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot that comes out of Columbus. It's more than just Olive Garden we're finding every day. <laughs> not even an Olive Garden there. Yeah, oh, there, there's not. They okay. do love it, though. Against their better judgment, the fine <laughs> folks of Columbus love, love the breadsticks, the never-ending soup bowls, whatever – crap that Olive Garden gives away. Well, I don't know how Ben Scott feels about Olive Garden, but um, he, he, he's <laughs> oh, an he interesting... likes milk. Yeah, we know he likes milk, and that was kind of fun, uh, as uh, as there were rumors that were correct that were floating that he was going to announce his uh, commitment to Nebraska. Of course, he was drinking a, a glass of uh, 2% milk, he said. Um, it wasn't eggnog or anything else, 2% milk. Um, so he's the milk man. He has played tackle and center. Um, it sounds like centers the, the job for him at Nebraska, which makes a lot of sense when you're trying to replace uh, Trent Hickson and really work on the interior of that front. Gives you some options where other guys can play. And it gives you a guy with, as you mentioned in the lead in, has three years of starting experience, kind of two and a half, because there was the COVID year 2020 where the Pac-12 was sort of almost not involved in college football, it didn't seem like. But um, he played that year for Arizona State. His numbers, as Bruns can get into, because uh, he's looked them over as well, like if you do the pro football focus stuff, his numbers at tackle come off better, at, according to whoever judged that. Um, but I know, like our writer at Arizona State, Chris Cartman, who covered that him, thought he was actually better in pass pro on the interior and um, last year at center. So – I think this is a natural move for him to just keep going where he left off at that position. And uh, it, it hopefully uh, takes away one point of angst for Nebraska football heading into this next year that you would have been really concerned with if Ben Scott had gone elsewhere, which we kind of thought he might about a week ago. <laughs> so this is quite a late uh, development for Nebraska in this, this cycle. Yeah. The, the numbers are interesting. Like the, the, the tackle numbers are definitely better, according to the, the Pro Football Focus folks. The the one thing that you probably need to put in proper context with him is even his center numbers, as they declined, according to Pro Football Focus, if you put him on Nebraska's roster last year, he would have been the highest graded um, offensive lineman last season. Um, and... What does that say about him? What does that say about Nebraska's offensive line? Yeah, I mean, you know, different defenses they faced, et cetera, et cetera, but it's noteworthy. Um, and we, we, I feel like we hammer on the center thing and have a lot, but I, I think it's noteworthy that Nebraska finally has somebody who has played center previously as their center. Like, it just has felt for over a decade now that – you know, Nebraska has kind of gotten the center position filled by finding a guard that can snap relatively well, or you, you had the Cam Jurgens, you know, that, that ended up looking pretty good after a while. But that's never been a position where Nebraska has gone out and, you know, just found a guy who's a natural center. And I, I know that, you know, he, he's played tackle too, but he's at least got power five starting experience at center. And I think that's noteworthy. Um, in, in terms of, you know, not only just the experience factor, but also, like Brian said, if you feel like you've got that that piece of the offensive line puzzle kind of figured out, that allows you to keep Noelle at guard. It allows you to kind of mess around maybe with where you put Turner Corcoran. Um, so that there's options there that I think uh, 
you know, will end up being good, good for Nebraska in the long term. And it, it's funny too. I mean, we, we can talk about it, but you know, Matt rule was pretty confident. I think that they were going to be better along the offensive line when he talked on national signing day. Um, you know, this wasn't headed towards Nebraska that day, but getting him in the fold, I think is huge in terms of just having, um, you know, getting older along the offensive line and getting more experience there. One thing I want to, I want to hit on real quickly and you guys can, you can go against it if, if you disagree, but I do want to say Trent Hickson did a nice job in, in sort of his one year. It felt like at times he was the most reliable offensive lineman. Uh, it didn't feel like a huge drop off from Cam Jurgens the year previously. Uh, they didn't really have any snap issues until kind of late in the season. So it, Hickson was going to be a big piece to replace because at least it felt like he gave you competency you weren't necessarily getting from the other four spots on the offensive line. And so being the guy that wasn't returning, it was sort of like a, oh, cool. So the 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 least of your worries is gone. Uh, everybody else is back. All right, let's see how that goes. So Ben Scott immediately sort of steps in there at center. That really helps out. Kind of, you know, bridges the gap to a guy that I think all three of us like uh, quite a bit, who looks like he's going to be the future center in Sam Sledge. So it, it gives you a little bit of time to build him up and, and get him in position where he could be a multi-year starter down the line. Uh, because I believe Ben Scott has two years of eligibility left. And so if he uses both of those, you'd be talking about a sophomore red shirt and Sam Sledge, if that's how this is to go. Now, obviously, Nebraska can go out and recruit how they're going to recruit. And Sam Sledge has to develop. But I think of the, the offensive linemen that they brought in in this class of the high school guys, Sam Sledge is the most defined in terms of position and and maybe the one that I, I feel safest in assuming becomes a starter for Nebraska. So they have a little bit of a setup there now um, at a position that, you know, Brunts, I think, described really well. And then you'd even touch on everyone's favorite part of the whole center conundrum. And that's when Justin Jackson stepped in and was outstanding for like 10 games in 2012, having never really played the position. How did you forget about Justin Jackson, Bronx? Well, I I figured after it, we're, we're a decade past that. So I figured that was. I know, but it's still the best center play that they've had. I know. Well, Cam Jurgens, once the, the snap issues got figured out, I think was, was relatively reliable. Those 10 but... games of Justin Jackson were outstanding. Yeah. Yeah, those are the days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's that that position has just been a little bit confounding to me. And you know, I think too, you know, Nebraska getting the true center out of the the portal, I think, is they're a little bit of a unicorn there. There's not a lot of guys that are yeah. just you know centers in there. Um, and offensive line recruiting, I feel like, is hard enough in the portal as it is. But when you start talking about center, those guys are at a, a total premium. Yeah. Let's was, stay right there with offensive line real quick. We we haven't, you know, had a chance to chat as a group since Matt Rule spoke on Wednesday. You guys were both in the room. Um, what did you make of his comments about why Donovan Rayola was retained? And, you know, even to go as far to sort of say he didn't even view the offensive line as the primary problem necessarily for Nebraska this past year. I mean, that's uh those are some comments right there as he as he sticks up for his offensive line coach, Donovan Rayola. I thought he was effective in two or three answers that he gave on that subject in laying out why he did what he did. Like, I thought he gave a good summarization of it because there will still be skeptics in there. That's fine. Um, but I thought it was clear that he wanted to say he obviously knows what's out there and in the wind about some of the people are like, why did you make that move? You know, they were the, one of the worst groups on the team and, and, and all that. And uh, I thought uh, the fact that he sort of pointed toward sometimes with an O line, it can be an identity problem with your offense more than those actual guys up front. And that's, he, he had a line in there, which really kind of hit on that. Um, and then I think the big thing, and I don't want to hog the whole answer, but was that he grew up in coaching, kind of learning the same technique, same format of O-line play as Riola. They, they kind of come from the same tree, however big that tree may be. Harry Highsand uh, is uh, Riola's mentor and um, Rule has a mentor or whatever that's connected to that same tree. So that he feels like Rule's an O-line, D-line guy, too. 
So he feels like he can be involved with Ryle and they can speak the same language is kind of what I got out of it. And then I do think it's interesting to note. Um, he said he talked to every player, not one person would say a bad word about Ryle. Like it was just like, even a, a guy who was transferring was like that we liked him as a coach. Um, so he got a lot of, uh, I think people who uh, stood on the table for him too. Um, you know, and when rule was talking to players, have either of you ever stood on a table? No. Like, no. have you ever needed to get to a light fixture or anything like that? I don't think I've stood on a table or recited, oh, captain, my captain, while standing on a table or anything like that. Yeah, I watched at a wedding in uh, in at the Beatrice Country Club one time, a very hefty man get on a table during the song Wagon Wheel. And was just like making some sort of wheel slash guitar motion, which didn't even make sense at the time. And everyone sort of crowded around with their phones. But I think because they thought they were going to get a viral moment of the table crashing to the to the bottom. But that's that's like the only time I can really think of anyone just getting on a table. And so I, I want to know where the phrase comes from. Yeah, I use these idioms. I, I, I want to know more. I don't think it's about wagon wheel guy, but he did bring the wedding reception together and he didn't die. And so, you know, there was no liability for the Beatrice Country Club. But I uh, I, I want to know where that, that you know, the, the idiom comes from. Maybe it's so rare that somebody gets on a table that that's why you use it. Like, it, it's just, uh, I don't know. What is it about tables, too? Because you could also be like, yeah, they pound the table for that guy. Something about tables just represents, you know, uniformity, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know the... You the... guys aren't ready for this conversation. No. I'm sorry. I busted that, it out 11 minutes into the pod. I made that it mean? seem like we were going to be all business, and here I am talking about tables. <laughs> I'll shut up and get out of the way. Talk football, Brunch. The No, you're go back to your Rayola question. It's Matt Rule knew that question was coming. I think he was very aware of what is out there, like you said, in, in the ether. Not a, And, and I, I would assume probably within the walls of the facility, too, if we're being honest. Um, but I think that's kind of, you know, the, the kind of logical steps that he laid out for why he made the decision that he did. And they interviewed other people, too. I was like, OK, that makes sense. Um, and when you have a head coach that's more offensive line focused, I mean, he's going to be down on that part of the field anyways. It's, it's not just, you know, going to be the Donovan Rayola show down there. So I, I think that all kind of. Yeah, I was like, OK, that that well, give it a shot. Let's see what this looks like. And the the interesting part to me, though, is we're going to get, I think, a pretty good kind of baseline of what that line looks like from last season going into this year, because it's going to be a, a lot of the same cast of characters. You know the names. Um, and, and, you know, kind of how that's going to look. So whether it's coaching, you know, how much you emphasize things, you know, th those kinds of things we'll see. But. I think we're going to get, you know, a, a good idea, I think, of of whether that decision was a good one or not pretty quickly on, uh, you know, how things look next year. So uh, one of the things that that kind of fascinates me is he sort of intimated that the way that that Rayola was trained sort of went against how they were calling plays, almost as if they can change up what happens in terms of play calling to make the line look better by syncing it all together. What that does to my brain is it makes me wonder, should I expect that they do things differently? Like, are they, you know, are they going to, I don't know what it is from a technical standpoint, but are they going to technically do things differently to sort of chain that up with Marcus Satterfield's play calling? I guess now I've got something I sort of <clears throat> go into the spring game wondering if, if we're going to see any sort of real difference there. Does that make sense? What I'm, what I'm trying to explain, but I'm <clears throat> failing. I feel like. Yeah, kind of. But also he mentioned that Satterfield at Carolina um, kind of worked with the O-line and uh, he gave a quote directly about how he liked there sort of there was might have been some future planning involved with that of like kind of your future OC wherever you're going to end up or he could be your OC at some point down the line again, um, getting uh, direct involvement with that group and kind of syncing it with how he wants to do things is sort of what I took out of it. It was, uh, you know, kind of a come and go statement. So you, you don't want to read too much into it, but, um, 
yeah, I I that I get what you're saying. That is going to be interesting, like how how sort of Satterfield rule and uh, Ryola kind of combine the minds on that. Um, and I, there must just be a feeling that uh, they they share enough in common with how they were brought up in coaching that they can get to that point uh, in a fairly efficient manner. I mean, the, Ben Scott, back to that real quick, that was sort of the whipped cream on top of the cocoa. I mean, they had a good signing day. Things are going pretty well. And, you know, you he did a nice job with what he stated about Riola, that rule that is, uh, kind of getting some fans who are doubters about that, thinking, okay, I'll have an open mind about it. And then a day or two later, you get news that, oh, yeah, the Riola family had an impact um, with Ben Scott, which we didn't really get into, but Don, he – he worked with Don Dominic, right? Uh, ben Scott did. Yep. Um, and he knows Donovan from, from his days in Honolulu. And uh, so he, he's Ben Scott told me, he's like, I'm, I think Donovan Ryle knows his stuff and I'm excited to, to learn it to help me get to the pro level. So you have this good Wednesday and then Thursday, Friday, you get sort of, Oh yeah, there's this also where uh, your, your old line coach that you just retained looks pretty good with a, with a big time addition. Yeah, the the one regret I have of not getting another podcast off last week is I feel like we could have went through and and just parsed individual statements uh, from from what Matt Rule had to say. One of those statements from last Wednesday had to do with with Jeff Sims and how other guys in the NFL were were texting him asking if they were going after this guy. Nebraska has Jeff Sims as its quarterback uh, potentially for next year. Could have Casey Thompson back. Could have any of those guys. Hadn't had anybody enter the portal yet that's currently on the roster. What did you guys make of the way Matt Rule spoke about Jeff Sims? And is he the unquestioned favorite to be the starter, assuming healthy, for that Minnesota game next August? We'll start with Michael Brunts, who's pondering these questions and more in the top right corner of your screen. He's going to get – well, he's going to have a big advantage. I mean, he's, he's healthy, and he's going to be able to go through spring ball, and he's going to be able to do things in spring ball. And that's a, a huge leg up when you're talking about a new offense. And I mean, you can watch as much film and take mental reps and whatever you want to call it. But I mean, if you're going to be in there for 14 practices in a spring game, you're going to have a pretty significant advantage. Oh, by the way, you're also kind of the chosen quarterback of a new coaching staff. I mean, that that's significant. And I don't know how much we talked about it after Matt Rule was hired and kind of the lead up to National Signing Day. But, I mean, there's no bigger kind of thing to check off the list for a new head coach than to make sure that you have a quarterback that matches what you're going to do on offense. I mean, I, I think that's maybe been in the past what has – I mean, the, you know, Mike Riley and his staff made the, the decision that they were not going to pursue a quarterback their first year. I think that that was a mistake. Um, you know, Nebraska went all in on Adrian Martinez – it, and I, I think, you know, the easiest way to kind of flip things is to get that quarterback question answered early on and, and to find your guy that fits so you're not having to adjust your offense to a certain guy. But, um, you know, Matt Rule was largely effusive in his praise of Jeff Sims. Uh, he called him an NFL guy, um, which that that was noteworthy to me. Um, so. You know, I, I think the belief is, is if they get him in a little bit of a better offensive system, he's got the tools to to really be pretty effective. And I mean, I think you're probably going to see a little bit more quarterback run game with him. I mean, I, I think a little bit more movement than maybe what Nebraska had last year uh, with Casey Thompson and Mark Whipple's offense. But yeah, I mean, that if you kind of go through the transcript of, of everything that was said on National Signing Day, I don't know that there was anybody that was uh, – more praised than Jeff Sims out of that group. So I can think of one name, but we'll we'll save that for the next oh, conversation. Yeah, I got you. Okay, but um, I know you're where you're going with that. But yeah, I, I th that was at least noteworthy to me, especially when you have a what it feels like a <clears throat> like a Baker's dozen quarterbacks. That's what they're working with right now. They actually have fourteen of them. <laughs> we'll we'll spend the next few podcasts breaking down each yeah. one individually what we think of the ball flight, how it leaves their hand, how that drop step works, all of that. We'll uh, we'll save those breakdowns as we get into January. BC, 
what what did you take away from the Jeff Sims talk? And then, of course, you know, Nebraska had these little interviews with different assistant coaches, which gives you a little insight into to how some of these guys who we've never met are thinking. And uh, Marcus Satterfield talked about Jeff Sims as well. Kind of what, what takeaways did you have about these conversations revolving around a three-year starter that in, in 24-7 sports, there's a lot of people that are very curious about Jeff Sims because they loved what they saw in high school. They loved what they saw in the Elite 11. And at times for Georgia Tech, it looked like it was working. And at other times, it looked like it was never going to work. My biggest takeaway is, you know, Rule is very skilled up front in front of the microphone. And we he, was, he showed that first off in the Riola thing, but also in the QB conversation. On any questions relating to Sims and also Casey Thompson, I felt like he shifted the uh, narrative in a hurry uh, without saying anything directly about, you know, not like who's QB1 or whatever. But a few days prior to that press conference, we had it confirmed from Charles Thompson that it is Casey's plan to return. And I think a common thought to that storyline is, well, there you go. Casey Thompson is, you know, he'll get healthy over the spring and whenever he returns in the summer, he, he'll be the QB one. And then there's sort of this, uh, you know, pecking order after him, they figure out that's not everybody was saying that, but that was sort of the surface level take. And then I think you listen to rule on Wednesday and you're like, no, that's not the, <laughs> like Jeff Sims has every bit as much a chance, if not more to be QB one. And they just love how they connect with that guy. And that's not to dismiss Casey from this conversation at all. I don't, but uh, I, I think it, it did shift thinking of like, okay, Jeff Sims is, he's not just brought here. You don't bring a guy like him from the portal who you talk about having NFL type talent as like, Oh, he's your second option. You know, like, yeah, that's not what, what you do. And, uh, I know Sims has had some INT problems. If you look at his resume, like at Georgia Tech, I think the TD interception ratio was like, what, 30 to 23 over a couple seasons, something like that. That's maybe a little too close. Uh, But Satterfield just was, in his interview uh, that he did with Huskers Radio Network, spoke about what a football junkie is and how they just like, it sounded like they just hit it up. They hit the ground running, talking about ball and all the stuff they can do. And that if you fix these one or two things, we think we can take your game to the next level. So there was a lot of Jeff Sims momentum that came out of listening to rule and Satterfield. The sort of, if, if you said, okay, you have to bet your, your uh, vehicle on uh, who's, who's going to start the first game. I'd, I'd say Sims. That's what I would say right now. Uh, I'd be right there with you. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I've said this a few different times. I mean, when he went into the portal, it was definitely someone who was like, oh, I want to see where this guy ends up because I've watched him a few times. The talent is intoxicating, but there's always sort of been that the little kind of, you know, mistake that follows or it just hasn't completely come together. So now that he's at Nebraska, it's going to be really, really interesting. All right. One player, and I, I hinted at it when, when Bruns was talking, one player that popped up uh, a little more than about everybody else on Wednesday and how Matt Rule spoke about him. And it's surprising because this isn't the highest rated guy in the class. And if you look at who Nebraska had to beat out to get Eric Fields, it's, it's, you know, it's unusual that a coach would even spend as much time as Rule did talking about him, but they are very high on the potential of this particular linebacker brunch. You've been following this one um, closely. This is a guy that, you know, you've, you've spoken to, to seven on seven coaches. You've checked around in the network on this. What is it about Eric? And you, you watched the film, you watched it before I did. You sent it to you. Like you, you like the film, not as much as Evan Cooper did at three in the morning, but you like the film. What, what is it about Eric Fields? Like why, why does it feel like this guy that was maybe the last in, is is kind of like the most intoxicating if you let your brain run with everything that Matt Rule did at Baylor, and now you got conversations about Evan Cooper watches film at three in the morning, texting about Eric Fields and how they have to go get this guy. Like, tell us more. What do we need to know about Eric Fields? Here, here's here's my theory, and he has great film. The film is great. Um, so in in ten games, he had 180 tackles. Um, 
he plays, and I think it was the second second largest class in in uh, Oklahoma and Ardmore. Ardmore, high. Yeah. And I think that there's something there. There's I think a few things that can kind of get a Nebraska football fan's heart palpitating a little bit. And I think one of those is a slightly undersized linebacker who moves really well sideline to sideline, who is extremely productive. It, it's there's there's like a Levante David mold, right? And I, I I hesitate to even throw the name out there, but I know that everybody thinks that when they watch his film because he's slightly undersized. He hits really hard once he gets to the to the ball. And he's always around the ball. And I, I think that part of it, if you just kind of watch the turn the huddle on for a couple minutes, you can see why Nebraska was like, okay, holy crap, like this is a guy we got to talk to. Um, from talking to coaches that have worked with him for a long time, um, he's a really rangy kid. He's got a good frame, so we can add a little bit of weight, but he's a little bit undersized. I mean, I, I could see why an Oklahoma or an Oklahoma State probably looked at him and said, you know, that that's not a guy for us right now. But he fits what Matt Rule has done everywhere. He he runs well. He's a good track guy. Uh, like I said, good frame. Um, and I think he would absolutely be a perfect fit in any kind of the – any any version of the three three five or whatever Nebraska is going to run with Tony White. So I think there's a lot of reason to like that. And I, you know, I was surprised that Matt rule was, as, was as effusive with the praise as he was, but he damn it, near got on the table for him. I know it makes, he was, he was, he, he had like one leg up on the table. He was starting to get up there, but uh, that's why. And I, I, you know, I, I think that there's something to, you know, you get a sleeper or that kind of thing, but uh, his dad was a, uh, a, a champion boxer. Uh, he had the the quote of probably the recruiting class to you, Schaefer, about how football is soft nowadays and it's all just pit pat, pit pat. Pit, pit, pat. <laughs> um, so yeah, he, he's he's an intriguing player, and I mean those types of guys are uh, if you can find them and you can get them in your class and you can develop them. I think that's a, a good roadmap for Nebraska. That was a long answer to an easy question. Uh, but th- there's a lot to like. That's fine. Eight, eight, nine year old Mike Schaefer has waited the rest of his life to see a linebacker that's captivated him the same way as Terrell Farley. So if you're if you're saying that there's an undersized linebacker that can do yep. a bunch of things, that's where my mind's going to go literally every time. No one will come close to uh, the the highlights that that man put up for Nebraska. But uh, <clears throat> if if someone can get in that stratosphere, I'm I'm here for it. I'm like the, I'm the ready. Like- I'm willing to. I'm willing to throw all of my considerable bulk behind them. The thing that puts it over the top track. is if you if you just casually mention the rover in, in the context of that too. It's like, oh, here we go. This it's like the the Vince McMahon yeah, meme. That, that's the where it's just like those different stills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BC has no idea what we're talking about with that. With the wrestling reference, yeah. I, I I I vaguely do. Yeah. What uh, what other takeaways do we have um, from Rules uh, Rules Wednesday appearance? I, I I'll say this: I mentioned it a couple times. Sure feels like that old uh, recruiting coordinator to position coach Evan Cooper didn't just leave the recruiting aspect behind when he got to start coaching yeah. um, defensive backs. I mean, that was a full throated endorsement of of kind of his evaluation skills and look, I mean, Evan Cooper had several commitments from guys that didn't even need to see Nebraska. Uh, I think it's notable that a lot of those guys, Eric Fields, Bryce Turner, um, uh, Seifuya, Sin- Sincere Seifuya, um, you know, all three of them are, were Evan Cooper evaluations. Like I, I, I think we sort of have our answer as to, you know, where some of these lottery tickets are, are necessarily coming from. The guys that he loved right there on film. I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, kind of uh, piggybacking off that, just the way he talked about his staff, the young staff. He said, they're a young staff. They're going to be stars. Just the confidence. He sort of spoke about that. I mean, he's like Terrence Knight, and no one's going to argue with what he's done in football already at age 36, having played in the NFL for eight years and all that. Um, 
he's a relatively new coach. He started at Wagner as of what, like 2019 was when mm-hmm. he first got into coaching and then uh, was the assistant D line coach at Carolina, which is different than being the main guy. And so I, I'll admit when I first saw Terrence Knighton's name that he was coming to Nebraska, I, we were trying to confirm for sure that he was the actual D line coach and not another position. But again, this goes back to rule very seamlessly in that 30 minutes or whatever it was hit on four or five different topics that were that were going to be talkers around here or maybe people would have some doubt about. And he sort of did it in a way that didn't make it obvious um, always that he was directly taking on those topics, but he succeeded, I thought, on making the point, this is why I hired these guys. This is why I hired young, you know, younger coaches and all this. Uh, I, I've, I've seen their track record. I know what they're going to do. I know they're hungry. And the way he emphasized they're going to have one vision. He had sort of that almost quote of the press conference. Uh, we're not going to have, uh, you know, like a the, the lead actor guy here. I'm trying to think of what his direct quote was. Celebrity, right? Celebrity coach. Yeah, celebrity coach. It's going to be a group of uh, full-time assistants who all have the same vision and they're all working together. And he really put an emphasis on that. And um, so – I do think there were people who were wondering a little bit. They always do about why didn't you go get this highly decorated 30 year coordinator or this coach that's been, you know, there for uh, three decades and been in all these power five leagues. And I thought he gave the answer as to why he hired the way he did. Yeah, no doubt about it. Nebraska still has some spots left to, to, to fill out their staff. He did give an answer that, uh, you know, by the first week of January, is that correct? Nebraska will have a full staff. Is that sort of what we're looking at here? Yep. January okay. 3rd. What we that's the, they can host transfer guys that first weekend. So it makes sense that that's kind of the, the target yeah. for what they want to do. Well, that wide receiver coach position basically feels like it's sort of the last uh, kind of interesting thing. They have someone locked up for it, according to Jalen Lloyd. Um, do you guys want to do you want to throw a guess out there in the ether? Or do we want to hold off on this? Um, I mean, I think there's a, certainly a profile that fits. I mean, it's got to be well, it's somebody, an NFL coach, right? An NFL coach, somebody that's younger is coached with rule. I mean, it, I think that's, you know, probably where we're looking at this point. I don't think it's, I, I would be, be floored if it was Joe Daly, who's the current wide receivers coach in Carolina. But, um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where we're headed. I mean, the linebackers coach has been out there. Kind of the same thing with, with Dvorak, a young guy that's coached with the rule, played for him. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, probably just waiting at this point for, for Carolina season to end. All right, let's finish this thing up. And Nebraska plays Iowa in basketball on Thursday. Not the finish that uh, people were hoping for. Um in the non-con, you know, you got the win against Queens, I guess, but it was sort of, I think a lot of Nebraska fans would have felt better if Nebraska had gotten that game against Kansas state. And that, that Kansas state game was sort of a portrait of if things just kind of go bad, this is what it, it, it could look like. I mean, none of your starters were really able to score. Uh, the bench really kind of carried them. They, they hung around. I mean, that's the thing about Nebraska is they've, they've shown a lot of heart this year. They haven't just rolled over. Um, when they've had those kind of ugly games, they they hang around and they can kind of try to cut things down a little bit, but weren't able to do that against Kansas State. Another tough test with Iowa, who's coming off of their own sort of embarrassing loss, uh, thirty-one point favorites, I believe, uh, in the in the game that they dropped here last week. So um, interesting game on Thursday. BC, what do we know? What are we looking <laughs> for here? Well, um, I think the layoff was really good for this team. Um, you know, they get, they had about an eight or nine day sort of break, um, between games. And so they were allowed to go home for a while, kind of hit reset. And now this is a, the full fledged grind begins. I think the game that you're still looking back that hurt. Yeah. The the performance against K state was not good. And I think we saw what can happen with this team when they're not winning 50 fifties, like Nebraska, this sort of roster and what they're the best at is they've got to be uh, the sort of energizer bunnies who make 50-50 balls like 75-25 type scenarios for them. Like they're getting all the loose balls and stuff like that. 
they forfeited that against Kansas State. K State got to those, and uh, there you go. But the game that hurts the most still is Purdue, but it's done. I mean, if Nebraska were right now had pulled that sucker off, and we're sitting here eight and five, one and one in the league as opposed to zero and two, that's the one you'd you'd be like, let's go. You know, people be rubbing their hands together, pretty fired up about it, because I do think we have to say in non-con they went seven and four. Uh, could have been a little bit better, but it was a tough schedule. And there's no like losses on there as there have been in past years where you're like, well, that's embarrassing. That's yeah. a real black guy. So they avoided that part. Every loss is to a formidable team. You know, you could go through them. St. John's, Memphis, K-State. Um, uh, who was the other one out there in that tournament in Orlando? Oklahoma. Somebody, Yeah, Oklahoma. So those are your four non-con losses, all quality teams. So uh, they should be ready for this. They've played – a great schedule. Um, Iowa can usually can, if they're hot, they can shoot you out of a gym, but if they're not, um, Nebraska is going to fly around and make them prove they can hit those shots. And if, if Iowa has a day where they're, they knock down 12 threes, you know, it could be a tough one for the Huskers, but if Nebraska can cause some chaos and get some loose balls, um, I think they, they, they could pull that one off. So uh, this is a big tilting game as you get into starting big 10 play. Will Graham McCaffrey get a technical? Yes. <laughs> it feels like yes. It feels like we're due for one, like a full-on frantrum. I feel Haven't like had one in a little bit. I feel like, he needs, like to, he needs to kind of stir the pot a little bit. I mean, you get you get absolutely destroyed uh, in in that get, that last game. I I think he he kind of come in and set the tone a little bit with a with a tee, get teed up. Yeah. What here's my one basketball question for you. Obviously, you know, greasel has been very important Walker, but if, if you want to have more of the Purdue type efforts versus more of, you know, like the, the K state type efforts, who's like the, the, the kind of sneaky important piece on that roster that has to show up more nights than not in your opinion. Um, I mean, Jawan Gary's a guy you could, site he's a i think he does as a garbage man for him and i mean that in a flattering way he does a lot of little stuff that don't always show up that matters a guy who who's got to have a good stretch in big 10 play is wilcher i mean he's he's a guy who plays a decent amount of minutes and uh, had a good stretch really this yeah. year he had he's had like a game or two where he gets hot but it's been the type of games like it was at indiana for example where uh, you know, you dig yourself a big hole. It's kind of a tough game to begin with because Greasel's not playing. And he got hot, had a career night, but he needs those kind of games where he gives you 12 to 13 and hits a few open shots, like against Iowa. That's it. Like Purdue had, had Wilcher hit one or two. And I'm not, I hate to pin it on one guy. There's a lot of guys who miss some open shots, but I think he was over in that game. And I'm, I'm, I'm using that as the, the case that he's that guy who's got to hit two or three of those. Um, That's why he's out there. He's not out yeah. there for any other reason. He's not yeah. out there for his defense. He's not out there for his leadership. He's not out there for his ball handling. He's out there to hit shots. Yeah, he doesn't He doesn't have to be the star. But if you say, okay, who's a guy like you go six, seven in on this roster where you need those couple of big shots, it's got to be him. Like he's got to hit some of those. And Tom and Aga, they, they, I've said this before on here, it feels like they switch off nights sometimes. And they've got to get it where there's sort of a consistency with both those guys giving you a couple shots every night at the same time and see where that takes you. All right. Uh, any final thoughts? Basketball, recruiting, Christmas. What was your best Christmas gift received, Brent? Uh, I got a new wallet. Uh, that, that oh, was I got a nice. new wallet, too. I did, too. Wow. <laughs> did our wives talk about this? How many, here's a question for you. How many wallets have you owned throughout your life? Um, is this where I admit that I had like a six year stretch where I used a binder clip and just wrapped dollars around like a handful of cards because I was too cheap to go replace a wallet. Is it fewer than five? It's like five or six going yeah, all the way five. back to the original Velcro wallet of being a six year old. Yeah. Didn't you didn't you feel like you're a, a big time dude like in elementary school when you busted out that Velcro wallet like in to go through the lunch line? Yeah, it was like orange. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listen to that. <laughs> I think this is my third. I, I think in my almost Whoa. 40 years of life, but this is this is number three. Have so. either of you ever had a wallet chain that you hooked to your back pocket? <laughs> no. I wasn't cool enough. I I mean, I haven't either, and I didn't suspect either of you did, but I really kind of wanted to believe that Millard North Brunts would roll through with his like wallet chain just to make sure no one pickpocketed him. No. I'm pretty sure that you couldn't have them. Like I, I think they were like a they were considered like a distraction <laughs> oh, or like a no. potential weapon. Oh mm. wow. Yeah, Miller North. Okay. Um I I actually have like more wallet thoughts now that I'm thinking about it. Front pocket <laughs> or uh do you guys sit on your wallet? I could stand I, it. I, I sit on it a lot, but I am I'm now to the age where if I see some people I view as suspect. I'll uh, I sw- I do the I switch it into my front like very obvious like in in front of people on the yeah like so you're on the I, why I switched to a uh, to that binder clip for like an eight year stretch starting in 2013 or whatever it was was because I just didn't want a wallet in my back pocket anymore like mine was kind of ratty and I was like oh, I got to get rid of this how about a money clip oh that's like eight bucks how about a forty cent binder clip let's roll. And uh, those, I, I haven't gone back to the back pocket wallet since. Now I just, it's always a front pocket thing. I, I can't even imagine how uncomfortable my 20s and 30s so far would have been if I was still sitting on a wallet. Like, how are you guys doing this? Going to the chiropractor of, every week? I, I got a lot of burrito cards in there. I got I might have to thin the herd a little bit. Yeah, that and pitcher cards from uh, from Aurora's. <laughs> Hey, those still work, by the way. I had one of their new owners tell me, if you have a pitcher card, they're still good. Don't get rid of them. That's good to know. I'll, uh, I've got like nine of them in a in a box somewhere. I'll get my house. money. Ch- I'll get my money chain from ni- late late 1990 and head down there for some some uh, two fifty pitchers of PBR. BC, did you uh, was was O'Rourke's a spot for the Daily Nebraskan in the the late 1900s? <clears throat> Um, it, yeah, sometimes it was, uh, iguanas back then was a big spot for, uh, okay. uh, it was 50 cent. This is how old I am. It was 50 cent the, on Thursday nights, the, the plastic. Did they do the, cups. like the Buffalo nickel thing when you, like you, you know, like you go in on a Monday and if you got a certain drink, you get like a, a token that you could like exchange for another drink later in the week. Was that I don't. Like I don't think so. Um, no. That's how they were bringing us in when they jack prices all the way up to two dollars a beer. Not to do advertising for people, but Iguanas was big. Sandy's was big uh, with Elk Creek, and uh, Harry's uh, Wonder Bar was oh, like okay. a was a big closer. Uh, to it was close a closer. The night, close the night. Yeah, it was like your closing uh, closing time song. Which That's like an play. island now. They're just like off on their own down there. Well, they they kind of were. You had to commit to the walk and all that mm. stuff. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, that was the part of it. My b- wallet, back to wallets quick. It, this is the first time I ever had one. It has a zipper on it. Like, so it zips up around the outside. You don't have to use a zipper, but uh, some might is say it a, it's a purse. It's a money pouch? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a... Right I think here. you, just, I think right you just described a purse, BC. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> you don't have to zip it though. It's a nice it's clutch. It got it's good. Re- All right, yeah, yeah. It got good reviews. It's European. That's right. You're right. not sophisticated enough for this. Uh, I see. I see. How many cards you got in there? Two, yeah, quite a few. Like bronze. It's ridiculous. Like I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna go through and actually make some, some cuts, some roster cuts. You know, something. You have some dead weight in there. It's like you got to trim. You got to get everything out of your eighty-five. It's just like a football roster. Nope. You get. You got to get the most out of it. You got to get it down. Processing <laughs> some cards. Yeah, you're doing tough conversation. All right. Well, if people want to continue these sort of great conversations, they can get them at husker 247com as long as well as great content. I promise you, it's really great. It's much better than this explanation that I'm giving right now. Uh, plenty of stuff coming up. There'll be a Van Poppel story. That uh, I want to I want to preview here. BC, do we have a, a timeline when you <laughs> you want to unveil that? It'll be on there by tomorrow for sure. Um, yeah, it, I don't want it, to. It'll be a nice story about uh, you know Riley and his dad Todd, who played uh, in the majors uh, for a long time, and 
um, sort of that situation of growing up with a dad who's like dad and they both talk to us for it and um, look forward to that. But yeah, there are all sorts of uh, features on guys who just signed and guys, 24 is going to be fascinating. That would be my, um, I mean, that's my sales pitch to people jump on right now and, and get over there. Cause you're going to have a, uh, there's going to be recruits that pop up suddenly like your Eric Fields types. And I think there's also going to be some uh, four star guys that uh, in, even in places like Texas where they have a real shot at because they have connections there. So it's going to be a, a great, I think, year to cover, follow recruiting and cover it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be coming up quick. I expect a, a lot of 2024 stuff in the month of January, especially as those coaches are getting out and, and uh, hitting buildings and, there's going to be events and everything else. So we'll have all of that coverage and more, of course, at Husker247.com. For Brian Christopherson, Michael Bruns, I'm Mike Shaver. We'll catch you later this week with more podcast content.